Hey, and welcome to The Short Stuff. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and Jer Jer Binks is here, too, and that makes The Short Stuff. She's sitting in for Dave C. Everybody say hi to Dave C. Hello, he'll, Dave. And he'll be glad to hear that later on. Yes, and this is not about pinky in the brain. It's about Botox in the brain. <laughs> yes, it is. Because when I saw Botox in the brain, I was like, that sounds like a TV show, but then I was like, no, I'm just thinking pinky in the brain. No, Botox in the brain is a cop show, not a cartoon. Big thanks to Helio and Live Science, uh, Very Well Health, Study Finds, Neuroscience News, and other sources. Take it away, Josh. So we're talking about Botox, right? Botox, I believe, is a brand name, but it's like Kleenex. It's become a, a proprietary eponym. Is well, it really? Yes, for sure. Huh. Yeah, there's all sorts of different brands of Botox, like Dysport and well, there's plenty of others. But um, what they all are is the botulinum toxin, or BTX. Mm-hmm. And that is produced by Clostridium botulinum. And botulism, anybody who's ever seen Dead Calm knows what botulism is and how horrible it's supposed to be. <laughs> but it's a, it's a bacteria that grows in the absence of air, typically on food. I think beef is like a real big grower of botulism, which is why if you ever have like a dented can of beef stew, just throw it away because it could kill you. <laughs> because botulin, um, or yeah, botulinum toxin is the most potent neurotoxin known to humans. And the reason it's so potent, Chuck, is it goes in there into your nerve cells mm -hmm. and it binds to them. And in particular, it binds to nerve cells where um, your blood and your muscles meet, which is usually fairly close to the skin. And it blocks acetylcholine from coming and getting into those um, the, the uh, ends of those nerve cells which means that those nerve cells just don't function, which means that your muscles are paralyzed, which is bad enough when it starts in your mouth, but then it goes to your throat and eventually your lungs, and then you die. A really terrible death from botulism. So it's, of course, totally unsurprising that somebody figured out that you could use this incredibly potent neurotoxin to get rid of wrinkles. <laughs> yeah, uh, using botulism, met I'm sorry, no, I guess it is botulism, using Botox medically, mm -hmm. Uh, came around in the 70s with Dr. Alan B. Scott, who uh, went to the FDA and said, hey, I think I can treat uh, strabismus, which is, um, I, I guess, wandering eye could be a lazy way of saying that or lazy eye. Sure. Uh, and he said, I think I can treat strabismus with this. FDA said, have at it. Um, he would inject it locally in the face. Uh, one thing that did was prove that it was safe to do, mm -hmm. relatively speaking. Yeah. And it could treat muscle disorders. Uh, and then starting in the 2000s is when it really came on the scene with estheticians um, doing what we all think of as, you know, Botox's main function now, which is you get these injections locally in very specific places in mm -hmm. your face, usually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it takes three or four days. And then all of a sudden, for about three months, uh, you will be walking around with uh, a forehead smooth as a shiny apple <laughs> and an expression that says nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can really get a good poker face from a, a round of Botox. Yeah. So, yeah, it just relaxes those muscles that cause the wrinkles, say, around your eyes, around your mouth and your forehead, in between your brow in particular. Those are called your 11s. Mm -hmm. And um, by paralyzing those muscles, it relaxes them and hence the wrinkles aren't there anymore. And like you said, it lasts for about three to four months. Uh, and because you can't, you have just a, like a, a blank face in a lot of ways, depending on where you get the Botox injection, you can't really smile. Like you physically are incapable of smiling because the muscles involved are paralyzed. More often, you can't really frown or furrow your brow because those muscles are paralyzed. And so right, like right off the bat, people were, started reporting that if you saw somebody with Botox, they they couldn't express emotion using their, their faces anymore for that three to four month period. Yeah. And to be clear, like, you know, you can make the shape of a smile with your mouth mm -hmm. and the shape of a smile or a frown with your mouth. Mm -hmm. But what people, you know, I think people realize this about to say what people don't realize. But when you think about it is what I meant to say. Right. You you express emotion with your face. It's you smile and frown with your face, not just your mouth. Sure. Your mouth may go up. Your mouth may, I guess, go down or express um, upsetness. But it's really, you know, people smile with their eyes and their faces. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you said, your brow gets furrowed. It's a, it's a whole face experience, which is a great album title. Yeah. Uh, 
and Botox, that's what it cuts off. You, you, and that's what can be kind of creepy looking is when someone is smiling with their mouth, but the rest of their face is dead. And it's a little strange. Looking. Yeah, played to great effect in Insidious. Right. <laughs> exactly. Love that stuff. Uh, should we take a break? Because this is where things get super interesting. Yes, I agree. Yes. All right. We'll be right back. So, uh, Chuck, it makes sense that you can't really read someone's emotions through their face after they've gotten a pretty good round of Botox. Um, But there was something stranger that started to come in as reports from people who got Botox injections or um, other kinds of uh, botulin injections that they weren't experiencing emotions like they used to. And in particular, this showed up most pronouncedly in people who suffered from depression. They started to notice that after they got um, uh, Botox injections in certain parts of their their face, especially Mm -hmm. around their forehead and their uh, brows called the glabular region, um, their depression symptoms, if they didn't If they weren't alleviated totally, they were certainly less pronounced than they had been before. And this was a little odd. Yeah, definitely a little bit odd. But um, so, again, we're not talking about showing emotion. We're talking about actually feeling the emotion. Right. Uh, But there's this thing, and it all kind of makes sense when you look at the big picture, called the facial feedback hypothesis. Yes. And a very sort of (laughs) dumbed-down way of saying it is that – uh, the idea of like, hey, if you're feeling depressed, maybe just try smiling more uh, because that can actually work. And they've done research on stuff like this. Mm-hmm. Um, one way it can, uh, you know, manifest itself is we have this tendency to mimic expressions of other people near us. And it's and it probably comes from just uh, evolution of like wanting to fit in in a group and like – Maybe so you won't be killed. Like everyone else here is smiling at that guy's and laughing at his joke. <laughs> right. So I'm I'm going to do the same thing. So just I just fit in better. And it's that facial feedback hypothesis at work where it it's sort of this feedback loop of of smiling from someone else will usually lend to a smile even if you're not feeling it mm-hmm. especially happy. I'm not I'm not saying like everyone's in a good mood so they're smiling, but literally just smiling because someone else in is smiling. And then that will, in turn, generally make your emotions pick up as well. Yeah, and the opposite can be true too. If you're scowling or you see someone else scowling, you mimic their scowl unconsciously, um, it will have a, a depressed state on your mood, right? And that's really interesting because people always thought that facial expressions reflected what you felt inside, not vice versa. But there's, it definitely goes both ways, and that's the facial feedback hypothesis. So when people started saying, like, my depression symptoms are kind of alleviated when I get Botox, mm-hmm. they chalked it up to facial feedback. Um, and in particular, what, what, they're, what they suspected is that in, with your brow area, the glabular region, so it's like the area right above your, the bridge of your nose up mm-hmm. to, you know, and kind of spreading out a, like a, a Jonathan Adler fan Oh, oh, above your eyebrows for a little bit, okay? Yeah, that's the you cut me off in traffic zone of my face. Exactly. Well put, Chuck. That's the new name of it, I would say. Uh-huh. If you get injections in that area, it actually has an effect on your amygdala. Amygdala is the seat of your fight or flight, just famous friend of the podcast, fight or flight um, yeah, response. In the early days. Yeah. Um, it's the seed of negative emotions like anger, fear, anxiety. And if you have depression, your amygdala is overactive and it causes you to develop a, a bias toward interpreting the world negatively and yourself negatively. And what they, they posited was that Botox short-circuited that feedback loop by paralyzing the muscles that trigger your amygdala to uh, experience negative emotions or produce negative emotions. Yeah, and not necessarily that it can completely take away those emotions, but it tamps it down and makes things less intense. Uh, and so they, you know, it, they basically stumbled upon this thing where they can actually treat depression through 
Botox injections. Yes, which is huge because it's not direct. It's not like they're injecting the needle into your amygdala and in, right. inserting the Botox in it. The Botox Ugh. is just acting on your muscles, but it's indirectly acting on your amygdala, which makes it a much safer treatment than, say, pharma that acts directly on your amygdala chemically. Yeah, and they've. this isn't just um, from talking to people and getting that kind of feedback. This has been confirmed in the Wonder Machine and the fMRI. Mm -hmm. uh, they've confirmed these findings. They basically, these scans showed uh, different kinds of altered activity in the amygdala uh, if you were a depressed patient who got those injections. And, you know, they basically are saying this is like a real thing now. Yes. So, yes, they've, they've shown that it, it alters the activity in the amygdala in not just patients with de uh, depression, but people who have borderline personality um, uh, disorder as well. Yeah, that's really interesting, I think. Their amygdala is on hyperdrive. And the thing that makes it different from depression is that um, it's also coupled with a lower uh, impulsivity threshold. So they're much more likely to lash out at people around them right. with those negative emotions, uh, which is what we talked about in our emotional pain episode, why, why it's just such a, a terrible disorder to have. But it's their amygdala being hyperactive as well. And so they found that Botox injections in the right place can actually reduce or eliminate um, BPD uh, as well, at least for the, the, the three to four months until your uh, muscles come back online and are able to trigger those emotions again. Yeah, and if you're uh, an adherent of acupuncture and you think, hey, this sounds kind of familiar, mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of along the same lines. Uh, they did um, comparison group treatments with acupuncture patients. Uh, and in acupuncture, it did show improved clinical symptoms, but it did not hold up under the Wonder Machine examination. No, it, like it still had its effect, but it didn't have a neurological effect. Botox has a neurological effect. It's actually acting on the amygdala. It's huge. It was a huge, huge breakthrough when they figured this out. And then now that they've proved it, it can also be used to treat anxiety if you um, inject it in your head and neck muscles. And you can use Botox to treat migraines. Yeah. Um, and insurance has started to cover it for migraines, um, but they're hoping that they'll start to cover it for things like depression or uh, borderline personality disorder or anxiety as well. Cover it, insurance. If it helps people, cover it. For sure. And my hat is off to my dear sweet wife, Yumi, who tipped me off to this one. Oh, nice. Thanks, Yumi. Yeah. Thanks, Yumi. Uh, since we both thanked Yumi, Chuck, wouldn't you say that short stuff is out? I would indeed. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.